My name is Vincent B. Donatio. I'm the marketing director at MarijuanaDoctors.com. We help patients find doctors who are certified, qualified, licensed, um, legally allowed to practice medical marijuana. They are experienced. Um, and our goal is really to have safe and affordable access to medical marijuana for those who seek it. Uh, Dr. Rosado, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Dr. Joseph Rosado, primary care physician by trade, medical cannabis physician in uh, Northeast Central Florida. I'm the chief medical officer for MarijuanaDoctors.com. I have been working with MarijuanaDoctors.com originally as a client in 2016 when we had law in the state of Florida that allowed us to be able to uh, recommend medical cannabis. So I started with as a client in late 2016 and then about a year, year and a half ago, I became the chief medical officer for MarijuanaDoctors.com, which provides an excellent platform for education for not only patients, but also physicians, because it talks about each one of the qualifying conditions that are allowed per legal state, but also for non-legal states, because non-legal medical cannabis states have CBD laws. And so it's able to educate the public as well as the physician regarding CBD, um, what the laws are, what's allowed, and then how cannabis or CBD works on the different qualifying conditions. On the topic of making sure that people can access medical marijuana um, and even other alternative medications um, for chronic pain relief, anxiety, depression, PTSD, um, why do you think more people are exploring medical marijuana for those conditions um, over other treatments that are available or treatments that they may be currently taking? So at present, the um, highest number or the highest incident of new patients are baby boomers. So people that were born from 1946 to 1964 are the biggest patient base for medical cannabis. And these individuals have been given a host of medications for the past 20 years. You know, many of these patients come into the office and they are on no less than five medications for anxiety, depression, insomnia, and chronic pain. Not to look, talk about, you know, their regular medications for, you know, high blood pressure, diabetes, gout, um, thyroid issues, etc. So you've got a host of medications and they're taking anywhere between, you know, 40 to 50 pills a day. In some cases, typically it's anywhere between 20 and 30 pills a day. And they're tired, they're sick and tired of feeling sick and tired because even though the medications are designed to help with anxiety, help with the depression, help with chronic pain, help with their blood pressure, help control their diabetes. They have no energy. They don't have any drive to be able to do many things. And so by transitioning to cannabis and us being able to wean them off of multiple medications, it helps them get their lives back. And now they're able to enjoy their activity, activities of daily living with their children, with their grandchildren, with, you know, with their loved ones. With daily living having changed a lot recently, um, how do you think that's affected people's um, access and desire to access medical marijuana? It's increased because in every legal medical cannabis state, they've made medical cannabis an essential business. And by allowing it to be an essential business, many patients have enrolled into the programs to be able to uh, you know, obtain medical cannabis for the added stress and depression and insomnia that they have. Yesterday, I spoke with a, a restaurant owner. It's been a family restaurant and it's been in the family for close to a hundred years. And now she's in charge of the restaurant and she had to dealt, deal with COVID-19. You know, from March until yesterday, she's lost 60 pounds. She had to close her restaurant down. She had to put all of her staff on furlough you know, and now they're back. And when she approached her cook and said, look, we're ready to rock and roll and come, I need you. His response was, no, I'm just gonna uh, 
continue to get uh, unemployment benefits because they I get more money through unemployment benefits than I did working at your restaurant. And she's like, that's not going to last forever. And he's like, it doesn't matter. It's lasting right now. Well, lo and behold, it didn't last forever. And when he went back to her, she's like, you chose to you know, get your money from the government. I found somebody else. But that stress of dealing with shutting down your restaurant, all of the lives and all the families that depended on you to have this business open so that they can feed their children and themselves, pay their rent, etc. You know, and then reopening and then having people say, no, I'm going to opt to get government money and not work for a living. You know, there was there's a lot of stuff going on. So it did not surprise me that she had lost 60 pounds in in what, six, seven months. So it, it's and it wasn't because she intentionally meant to do so. Right. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Uh there's a lot of businesses around me um, here in New York that have just straight up closed down. Um, and uh, a lot of them are not planning to reopen. You know, like the owners have gone and found something else to do. Like they're not, their business is gone. The thing that they worked for the whole, their whole lives uh, basically is snuffed out. Um, <clears throat> so you mentioned that uh, most people seeking out medical marijuana are, uh, baby boomers. Um, what do you think motivates them the most? You mentioned that a lot of them have a lot of pills that they take and a lot of them have a lot of painful conditions and um, a lot of them have other things like diabetes and um, and, and other kind of conditions like that. Uh, but what do you think is like the real driving force behind the interest in medical marijuana among that age group? they've realized that what they've been doing for all the years that they've been doing it is not working. You know, they are, they're taking pain medication, but yet they're in pain all the time. You know, they take anxiety medication, but they're still anxious. You know, they're, so the medications that they are taking, they're not working and they, they need something that does work. Number one, number two, they're looking to be more holistic, you know, because I, you know, I'm, I'm a late baby boomer. I was born in 1962. And so I can relate to, to the groups, you know, my the patients, because they're, they're in my age group pretty much. And I just see how we want to be more active. We want to do more things, but if we don't have the energy to do it, or if we're living our lives based on our alarm on our cell phone to remind us when to take our next pill, that's not living. That's not life. And so for that reason and those reasons, they, they've realized there's got to be a better way. And with all of the marketing and all of the media, both, you know, social media as well as mainstream media talking about cannabis in a medical capacity, you know, it's stimulated a lot of thought and they've started researching and their kids are talking to them and saying, you know, you should try this, you know, you know, their kids are millennials. It's like, you should try this. You, you know, this, this may work for you. And so initially they'll resist, but then it gets to the point where they're so frustrated that they're willing to try anything. And it's really, you know, they're just sick and tired of being sick and tired. And a lot of them used to smoke cannabis back in the day too. You know? Exactly. <laughs> you know, um, from high school, you know, junior high school, high school, college, you know, under the bleachers, you know, a, a group of us at some time in our lives were out there participating. Yep. My dad was there. I know that. Um, so, uh, and how old is your dad? Uh, he just turned 64. So he, he, he falls in that baby boomer category. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> how affordable is medical cannabis compared to a lot of those things that people are taking? Uh, maybe like, um, I mean, I don't want to name particular 
names, mm -hmm. but you know, like the typical anxiety and, and depression medications or, or like opioids and stuff like that. Well, can, medical cannabis is at a disadvantage in that insurance companies do not pay for the medical cannabis. And so with their conventional medications, they have a copay. It depends on how good of an insurance they have will determine what their copay is. But if they're taking, you know, 20 to 30 pills a day, now you have to take into consideration all of the copays for every one of those medications. And when you add that, then now you're able to comp compare what the price of medical cannabis is. Um, for example, in Central Florida, one of our dispensaries sells a disposable pen that contains 120 doses, okay? And the price of that pen is $25. It's a vaporizer well, pen, right? Exactly, a yes. handheld vaporizer pen. And so you, you take it, to, you consider, okay, it's 120 doses and $25. And they, let's say they do, you know, two to three inhalations every four to six hours because typically we tell them to do it every two to four hours. Let's say they do it four hours, every four hours, just the same way they take a pain medication that they take, you know, a hydrocodone with Tylenol or, uh, or um, oxycodone with acetaminophen, either one of those, they have to take it every six hours. Okay. So let's say four, every four hours, just to be safe. So now you're looking at every four hours doing two to three inhalations. That's about what? eight inhalations per day, waking hours. So you're looking at this vape pen lasting about like a week three, and a half. I'm sorry? Like a week and a half, two weeks. Exactly, about a week and a half, two weeks. Let's say two weeks. So they, so they need two for the month, or if they use one for daytime use and one for evening use, then it'll last them longer. So that, so you're looking at two pens per month. That's 50 bucks which is going to be much less than their co their combined copay for all of the medications that they're on. Flour is going to be less expensive because, you know, the vape pen, you have to take into consideration the concentrated oil and the extraction of that oil from the flour. Well, the flour is going to last longer and, you know, we'll give them more bang for their buck. And Especially if you vape it instead of smoke it because you use exactly. much less. Exactly. If you're using a handheld vaporizer and you set the temperatures on to get each one of the different phytocannabinoids, now you're able to use one loading multiple times because if you're set it at a lower temperature, you're getting more of the acids, mm -hmm. you know, with, which Ruffalo, which you, know, you know, the pioneer of cannabis is talking about using the acid form because it's got greater affinity in the receptors. So you're using more of the acids now you're getting more bang for your buck and then as you increase the temperature now you're able to transition from the acid form to the active form and once you get to like 220 degrees fahrenheit that's what converts that's the temperature where thca converts to thc cbda converts to cbd now you're going to get your thc and cbd but prior to that you were getting all the acids as much as you can so you're going to be able to utilize that one loading in that vape pen much longer right and the, and the concentrates are typically the active forms you don't really get the acid form precisely exactly um all right do you actually do you see um or do you hear of uh, other primary care physicians who are not certified for medical marijuana ever mentioning it to their patients Yes, um, and and that's my biggest source of referral. Because, really? Yeah, because that's how I built. In essence, have built my practice. Um, one of the ways, because when you're in business, you got to you got to come up with creative ways. You know, the marijuana doctors was the big shot in the arm to get people in because I hit the ground running. I was, you know, one of the first thirty doctors to be certified in the state of Florida, but the first in my region to recommend to an adult that had brain cancer, and then the first in the state to recommend to a pediatric patient, 15 year old that had a very aggressive head and neck cancer. Hmm. So being on, you know, 
um, on media, you know, mainstream media and, and having people see my interviews on television and in the newspaper helped build my practice. So, you know, yeah, of course. they saw me on TV, they heard me on the radio, they read about me in the newspaper or on the digital newspaper, and then they go online and what pops up? Marijuana doctors, Joseph Rosado. So, so now they're getting double confirmation and they call called the office and and it was like a cycle that went crazy so we're so actually that's how i built my practice and that's how i got there but now uh, because there are more doctors doing using medical cannabis i've gone to primary care doctors offices as well as hematologists oncologists offices ophthalmologists um you know different specialties that deal with the qualifying conditions and then I go to them and say, look, I, you're not registered on the registry. I know you're not a medical cannabis doctor. If any of your patients, which I'm sure many are asking you about it, ask, here's my brochure, here's my card. You don't have to say anything else. Just if somebody says, I'm, I'm looking at or I'm considering medical cannabis, just say, here you go. I give them, you know, we take them lunch. I spend, you know, 15, 20 minutes educating them on the endocannabinoid system and we talk about different modes of administration, address all their questions, address all their fears. And once they're good, we're out. And that's been a very good source of, you know, referrals to the office from other doctor's offices that don't want to do it, aren't interested in doing it, but they want their patients to be able to get the medication that they want to get and not have to rely on going to the black market and buying it there. Of course, yeah. And uh, you actually touched on a, on a really important point that uh, I was I was hoping to be able to talk with you a little bit about. Um, and, you know, I mean, you've been working with us, MarijuanaDoctors.com, for a bit. And um, But aside for like, outside of that, um, or even with your colleagues, like, what kind of difficulties do you face uh, reaching the people that really need to get access to this medicine um, but you know, they either may lack the resources, they may lack the time, they may lack, um, the money, they, um, like, how do you, how do you get in front of them? Uh, we at the office, we were doing a cannabis 101 where we would have our patients bring their family members, their friends to the office. And once a month I would speak to a, a room full of, you know, 50, between 50 and hundred people explaining to them what cannabis was, how it worked, you know, just some basics. And they walked out with some knowledge, but at, you know, from there they knew what was going on and they were able to make a decision whether they wanted to become a patient or not. But many of them did not become patients on that evening, but right. one, two, three, four months down the road, something happens or something clicks in their brain and they're like, okay, or they see their loved one able to do things that they couldn't do before. Or the, the one I get a lot from the wives is my husband is much easier to live with ever since he's been on the cannabis. <laughs> once, once they see a switch or a change in their loved one for the better. And they're like, I want that, whatever you've got, I want. And so <laughs> that, that, you know, so patient re patient referrals is really our number one source of referral, you know, followed by physicians in the community, followed by the, the you know the plat being on on marijuana doctors platform, followed by everything else I do because last year, as you know, I went to eight different countries speaking on medical cannabis. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a whirlwind book tour because I wrote and published my book, Hope and Healing: The Case for Cannabis. And the uh, forward was written by the gentleman who named the first endocannabinoid, an endomite, Professor Lumir Hanush. And so I did this whirlwind book tour. Um, so for the uh, for the physicians who um, who don't uh, have the time or resources to write a book and go on a world tour, um, what uh, what have you seen them doing that uh, that's been helping them out uh, in terms of uh, you know, getting in front of uh, new patients in their areas. Uh, the main thing is is going out into the public. Uh, so a lot of them are, are setting up 
or have partnered with like health food stores um, or um, different uh, events such as like uh, fairs, different types of fairs, outdoor fairs, uh, art festivals, things like that. And so they go, they show up, you know, they set up a table, they set up a booth and, and they talk to people, um, which reminds me of like, you know, my chiropractic days, because prior to being a medical doctor, I was a chiropractor. And, you know, I, I watched all my professors going to like flea markets and doing spinal screenings and, you know, going to the mall and going here and there. And so the same thing that chiropractors have been doing for years and dentists, physicians are doing, w but with cannabis, you know, they're doing cannabis one-on-ones um, in hmm. public libraries. I did that once I, I went to a local public library and spoke there um, or any event, any community event, um, radio, you know, some people have been able to advertise on radio, but again, it's a really sore subject and real, a real challenge. Yeah. Because you've got the FCC that oversees, and the F in FCC is federal, just like the F <laughs> in FDIC is federal. So, you know, it, they, a lot of radio stations, that. you can't advertise. So, you know, I was, you know, I was fortunate that being that I was one of the first in the state, I was able to, you know, ride the dovetail, you know, ride the tails of marijuana doctors. And that helped. And so a lot of other colleagues have gone there. And because it's by zip code and by region, you know, it, it keeps competition to a minimum. And so mm -hmm. it's an excellent source and resource because the way the platform is set up, and you could probably speak better to this than myself, but the way the platform is set up, patients can write reviews on there, patients can do everything. It's all streamlined to where they find a doctor. They reach out to the doctor, they make their appointment, and then they can write a review for the physician all in one. And I believe there's a, a, cap a capacity or a capability to use it as an electronic medical record, which from there they can gather, you know, a lot of data and statistics and be able to prove, you know, things that I've said here, like the average age group to my practice is 57 years of age. So you would know what the average age group is, you would know what the most common diagnosis is in my office. I know that my number one diagnosis is chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Beyond the shadow of a doubt. You know, I, and I have a lecture, top 10 conditions of a medical cannabis practice. And I go from, you know, what percentage are male, what percentage are females, uh, what the average age is, and then what the top 10 diagnoses are that people come to my office to see me. And I gave that talk in Fiji last year because I didn't speak to a group of doctors. I go to, I spoke to a group of attorneys. There were about between four and 500 attorneys in this massive hall. And it was put on by the attorney general for Fiji. So there were attorneys there from Australia, from New Zealand, from Samoa, from American Samoa, and from all the that Pacific brim. And it was cool because there was there were no healthcare professionals in the building. It was just me and attorneys. And <laughs> and by the end, you know, they started coming up to me and telling me what the laws were in their respective countries. And you know, I'm scratching my head, going, "Damn!" So, but that was the talk that I gave them were the top ten conditions to kind of get into their brain that it's not. People aren't using it to get high. People aren't using it to escape reality. People yeah. are using it to get away from the things that have prohibited them to have a good quality of life. Yeah. And I, honestly, even a lot of the people that use it recreationally are really using it medically. They just don't really realize it. Exactly. Because the same endocannabinoid receptors that are in the sick patients are in the non-sick patients that are doing it just to get high. Yeah. It works on those same receptors, and the receptors are found all over the body. Yeah, and a lot of people just don't know like what anxiety really feels like. So if, if someone just feels like, oh, I had such a bad day today, I'm going to go smoke a bowl. Um, it's like they're medicating. Um, they don't realize that they're medicating, but like they're, they're, they're just escaping. But, um, you know, they're, they're using something that has, uh, you know, a, a wealth of research that is growing and growing now to show that it has a medical use for the very thing that they complain about. Um, 
you know, they may not be medical users, but I, I consider them, you know, they're, they're self-medical users. Exactly. They're self-medicating. That's how I, that's an excellent term because that's the term I use a lot. You know, you have been self-medicating. You know, you've been getting your own medication, you've been getting your medication on your own, not knowing what worked, what didn't work. It's been through, through trial and error, which is the way medical practice is. It's called practice. It's not called perfection. Less than 10% of the medical schools in the United States speak about or touch on the endocannabinoid system. So many of us didn't learn everything that we know until we got out of medical school. We got out of our internships, our residencies, our fellowships. That's when we actually figured things out. You know, I was fortunate that in my medical school, we did speak briefly on the endocannabinoid system. And that, but it, immediately that conversation went to how toxic it was and how bad it was and how addictive it was. And I went home that night and went to my pharmacology books and started reading up on, you know, cannabis sativa and, and realized, hey, wait a minute, this is another tool. This is another medicine. But I was going, you know, medicine was my sixth career. I was in a you know, third world country, which is where I went to medical school. You know, I was a father of twin daughters and married at the time. And so, you know, I wasn't going to push too many envelopes in medical school. But once I got out, that was a different story. And then in 2010, when it became medically legal in Arizona, one of my best friends reached out to me and said, hey, you know, I want to get this done. I want to get this started. But to have a dispensary, I need to have a, a, a medical director. I'm like, sign me up. Hmm. So we began the process to do that. That project fell through. And then I had to wait an additional four years before the conversation began in Florida. And in 2014, the conversation began. I reached out to John Morgan, who was pocketing and funding the campaign. Told him I was a physician, I was an advocate, how I could get involved. He put me in touch with the campaign manager. Campaign manager spent the first 15 minutes of the conversation talking me out of it because most physicians were like, yeah, yeah, I'm all going home. Oh, yeah, I want to do this. And then they go to the hospital and the hospital says, you promote this, we're taking your privileges away. Or the, his partners or her partners go up to him and say, you keep saying this in your office or in your consultations, you're out of the group because we don't promote that here. Yeah, that's been a big uh, concern, especially here in New York, because uh, a lot of doctors are have a lot of hospital affiliations. Um, big hospitals have kind of been taking over all the small practices all right. over New York. And uh, you know, doctors, they either, <laughs> they either get forced into retirement or they, uh, or they just start up their own practice again, doing medical marijuana. Right, and so that's what happened, you know, so I told him, I said, don't worry about it, you know, count on me. And so I became an advocate way, way, way before I, I made my first recommendation mm. because I, I started being, I became an advocate in, in February, March of 2014. I didn't write my first recommendation until late August, 2016. So. Hmm. All right. Um, yeah, that's uh, I mean, that's a wild story. That's, that's pretty cool that you gone from all over the world to a couple of different places within the country. And, you know, from when you first learned about it, it was poison. And, and now it's uh, generally accepted in uh, more than half of the country to be uh, a great alternative medicine to a lot of things. Yeah, you know, um, there, there's 2500 doctors that are registered to recommend in the state of Florida. And wow. we have a little over 400,000 patients in, in the registry. But there's 22 million people in the state of Florida. Yeah. So it's like less than what? 0.5%? Mm -hmm. At You know, if, if my math doesn't fail me so quickly, but it's like, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's, but it, it's, a, it's a very small portion of the population, but they're, you know, it's becoming a louder um, portion of the population. They are and, that. Uh, Once they get the great results, they're, yeah. you know, they're standing on the street corner pounding, you know, it's benefits. There was one other thing that I wanted to ask you. Um, and uh, I think in being such a prominent physician in Florida, um, you probably see this a lot. Um, how, how do you think those in, um, 
you know, minority communities and those of, uh, uh, you know, lower uh, in, in, the, in like the poverty level, how do they, first of all, find out about this medicine being available to them? And then how do they go about accessing it? And are there, are there any systems in place um, to help them? Like, are there, are there dispensaries that like, uh, you know, have some kind of assistance program or anything like that? Excellent question. And uh, you, you teed it up very high for me. So thank you. I don't know if you knew this, but I am the medical director for minorities for medical marijuana. I did not know that. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Perfect question for you. <laughs> Go yeah. ahead. So, so I am I am the medical director for Minorities for Medical Marijuana, or M4MM, as you will find us on Instagram, Why I know Facebook, uh, everywhere. And we have multiple chapters all over the United States, as well as Jamaica and, and some islands in the Caribbean, etc. And our whole goal is education. Now, you've heard us speak throughout this conversation about cannabis even though md marijuana doctors we've used the word marijuana very very limited the majority has been cannabis, cannabis. because if you read my book you'll discover that the term marijuana is a derogatory racial slur that was used and it started and the government made it up in the late 30s in 1937 um, by a gentleman uh, by the name of Harry Aislinger, who was the first drug czar for the United States. So you will discover why we typically do not use the word marijuana, but yet we're using minorities for medical marijuana. It's kind of <laughs> like an oxymoron. The reason we use that word is because when we go into our black and brown communities and speak about cannabis, they're like, what? What's that? But when you say marijuana oh yeah i know what that is so mm -hmm. you're using the terminology that they are familiar with because they've been brainwashed for so many years to use it number one number two the use of cannabis has been so detrimental to those communities they got busted for you know having a dime bag or a nickel bag in their back pocket you know or or having paraphernalia driving around with the paraphernalia having a pipe or a roach clip hanging from their rearview mirror. And so they're they're incarcerated. They don't have the funds to hire a real attorney, so they hire, you know, a public, you know, defender mm -hmm. who has God knows how many cases on the docket and everything is let's plea, let's you know, plea bargain, plea bargain, plea bargain. And so these kids' lives are ruined literally forever. You know, it wasn't until a couple years ago that we voted you know 2016 we voted to allow our former inmates to vote but then the state of florida turned around and said okay yeah you can vote after you've paid all of your fees that you owe to the state of florida during the time that you were incarcerated so you can't vote if you are an ex-con or you know a, a former uh, inmate you can't do that and so people's lives are ruined for a freaking plant that in 33 states of the United States is medically legal and two U.S. territories, Puerto Rico and Guam and Washington, D.C. And Washington, D.C., yep. If, if a patient goes to their, their primary care physician, you know, for chronic pain, they've been taking opioids, they don't like how they feel on them or, um, or, for, or you know, they, uh, their psychiatrist and they don't like, um, you know, what their antidepressant is doing to them on a daily basis. Um, and they ask about medical marijuana, but they're shut down by their physician. Um, what do you recommend th for those patients? Like, what, what do you think they should do in that case? Go to MarijuanaDoctors.com. <laughs> I guess I mean, learn it's, it's, and find it's, another well, doctor. Like, is that, <laughs> it, it, is, that it, is that low key? Just find another doctor. <laughs> it, well, here's the thing, and, and he, he, here's what a lot of people don't know. Just because your primary care doctor said no, doesn't mean that you don't qualify. Right. It doesn't mean that you cannot have another doctor be your medical cannabis doctor. That's I, I'm the medical cannabis doctor to close to 4,000 people. I don't do primary care any longer. So oh, wow. 
because of that, you know, and I tell when I go to the different primary care doctors' offices, I let them know right, right off the bat. You know, I'm a New Yorker. I'm a New Yorkerian from the Bronx. Right off the bat, I let them know. Look, I am not a primary care physician. I no longer do primary care physician medicine. I am not interested in doing primary care medicine. So you will not lose your patient. You send them to me for medical cannabis. That's all they're going to get, and they will come right back to your office for their primary care needs. I'm not going to refill any of their medications. I'm not going to take over monitoring their blood pressure or their blood sugar. I take blood pressure because it's mandatory for me to take a set of vital signs to make it a doctor's visit. Mm-hmm. Other than that, I don't do that. So for that reason, you know, a patient can legally and safely go to a medical cannabis doctor and say, you know, my primary care physician is not for this. It's against me doing this, but I want to do this. Mm-hmm. Fine. One ha- has nothing to do. Nothing with wrong that. with a second opinion, anyway. Exactly. Or a third, or a fourth. <laughs> exactly. Until you get to the doctor. I mean, the, the, my first, my first medical cannabis patient, the 35-year-old that had brain cancer. She called five different doctor's offices before she got to mine. Hmm. And everyone, because it was still a new program, we still had no product. The laws were still kind of hazy wasn't clear what we could and couldn't do so she was calling doctor's offices and they're like no we're going to hold off on that no we're not ready to do that yet my staff was on point they were ready and i told them anybody calls this office about medical cannabis you get them in immediately because i knew what the law wrote you know what they had written in the law that you mm-hmm. had to have a 90 day doctor patient relationship we had to establish 90 days anyway get them in and once we complete and comply with the 90 days, once there was product available, boom, here's your here's your recommendation. Let's get it started. But a lot of doctors weren't familiar with the law. Mm-hmm. And so now granted that that was done away with, but that's how we started the medical cannabis program in the state of Florida. Yeah, a lot four of states started that way. Four diagnoses and you had to establish a, a 90 day doctor patient relationship. That was it. Nothing more than that. And no products available anywhere. Yeah. And Missouri went through that. They had no products available for over a year. <laughs> so it's wild. What do you we think? Had a um, CDG law. Yeah. You know, we had the Compassionate Care Act, you know, yeah. Bill 1030, that was signed into law June of 2014. But that was done as a ploy to mess with the head of the voters that were voting in November 2014. Because the opposition said there's already a medical cannabis Hmm. law in the book. It's called the Compassionate Care Act. And so the voters were like, oh, yeah, there's a law. So why do we need this? Oh, because people want to get high. They want to use it recreationally. And and then people like, oh, no, we don't want that because they were they were ill informed. Mm -hmm. One more thing. Um, Aside from cannabis. I know that you have experience with some other alternative medications that are kind of like up and coming. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of them are legal. Some of them are currently not legal in most places. Um, Ketamine I know is legal in, I think all 50 States. Um, It's a, it's a schedule three drug, right? Yep. And, uh, and psilocybin being, I believe still schedule one, but there are trials in Colorado and Wyoming. Well, Oregon, the, the, Oregon. The, I think. the FDA has. Um, I just read this yesterday. There is a there is a uh, a clinical trial that's in phase three for psilocybin for depression. Oh, interesting. Okay, is that the nasal spray one or the uh, many of the, the pills? Tools. Yeah, if you if you if people want to want to get information on the use of psychedelics for depression, for PTSD, for anxiety for depression associated with chronic pain, which are the qualifying conditions. Um, Check it out. It's really interesting that the majority of the research is being done in Ivy League schools, Mm -hmm. Yale and Harvard and Princeton. Yale, Harvard, Princeton all have ketamine clinics. They have ketamine assisted psychotherapy. 
um, the ketamine protocol is called the Yale, the Yale protocol. protocol. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, well, uh, that's all I have for you. Um, again, this is uh, Dr. Joseph Rosado. Um, I'm Vincent B. Donatio, MarijuanaDoctors.com. And uh, it was great speaking with you. I learned a lot of new things about you. I've been working with you for over a year, and I didn't even know half of this stuff. So um, uh, that's great. Um, and definitely, I would love to connect with you on the um, Minorities for Medical Marijuana um, project. I, 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 that's something I would like to get involved with as well. Absolutely. It'd be my pleasure. I'll put you in touch with our president, CEO, founder, Roz McCarthy. Okay, who's, cool. Who's an amazing woman. And... Um, We'll go from there. But yeah, thank you for inviting me today and have this conversation. Anytime. It was, it was cool. Thanks. I appreciate yep. it. Thank you very much for joining.